Oh, hi. You've caught me playing drums. Were you... You, you, wanted, you wanted me to look at space weather and things like that? Really? That's your... Oh, all right. Well, here's the sun. It's in 171 angstroms in, in this view right here. And we see a small sunspot there in the southwest. Otherwise, fairly low levels of activity. And uh, yeah, there you go. So there's your uh, there's your space weather, the sun. It's a it's a thing. Now let me get let me get back to it. Okay. Oh wait, you want me to talk about other things? Oh, all right. I, I, I apologize. I, I get so sidetracked. What was this? Happening? So uh, uh, here's some here's Helio Viewer, and uh, there are the fields. Um, Oh my god, we don't even have Epic Pen open today. So this sunspot's pretty small, and when I say it's pretty small, I mean about the size of the Earth. And, uh, well, the umbra's a little smaller than that, but uh, anyway, there's the... The fields are about the size of the Earth, give or take. So it's, it's a pretty small sunspot, and here's the fade to 304 angstroms. Not particularly exciting. Here's the full disk view, which we normally show you. And we don't see a lot going on besides that small sunspot. The activity that looked like it was rising yesterday doesn't look as active as it was, but there's still something going on over there, so keep an eye on that. Here's the current state of affairs when it comes to the umbra, and it's barely an umbra. You can see underneath my pointer there. Pretty small umbra. And there's the latest colorized magnetogram. And I don't think it's a beta class. I think it's still alpha class. It could actually be getting bigger here. Who knows? But it's so close to the edge of the disk that we're really not sure. Now, I wanted to announce yesterday's video that we made with Eugene Bagashov. Shout out to Eugene. Cheers. We made a video yesterday called Terms Defined. Featuring special guest Eugene the Philosopher, Socialism. And we just basically talk about whatever we want. And uh, yeah, so that might be something to watch later today. And we're planning on preview, uh, premiering that at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So yeah, thanks for tuning in to the Daily Space Weather, and just let me get back to it here. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. supposed to talk about other stuff. I'm told, I'm told I'm supposed to talk about other things too. All right. Okay. Am I supposed to talk about, wait a minute. Am I supposed to talk about like Texas realtors who've stopped using the term master bedroom over slavery connotations? Is that, is that a thing that I'm supposed to talk about? Is that, is it, wait, am I supposed to talk about, um, clouds? Should I, should I talk about clouds? Should, should that be a thing? Um, I don't know. Maybe an article about how clouds may be. It might be clouds that are causing all the global warming because of people writing models about how atmospheric physics works. <laughs> and now they're including clouds as... <laughs> all right. I, I apologize for this temporary aside. Let's look at the real-time solar wind. <clears throat> so today's real-time solar wind is brought to you by me at massive personal expense. And please bear with me a minute before I, before I break that down, as it seems that I've grown to too large of a size. So I must shrink down to a smaller size, which may cause me to be consumed in the fire. It's okay, folks. I, I'll be fine. I was built for this. All right, so Fly Angle's currently at about, I don't know, 
There we go. 300 degrees. We did see a big shift in the BTBZ here yesterday, but it's come back down to more normal levels here. Current solar wind density quite low, 2.79 protons per cubic centimeter. Solar wind speed, 352 kilometers per second. Let's take a look at some other stuff, like perhaps, oh, I don't know, the X-ray flux. And yeah, oh yeah, it's a Sunday edition, folks. So you never know what may happen on a Sunday edition. We do see a tiny little uptick in X-ray flux there, probably because of that sunspot. And uh, I wouldn't bet the farm or anything on it, because frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Next, we'll look at the geospace magnetosphere movies. And uh, please leave a comment if, you, if you're delighted that Gone with the Wind is Gone with the Wind, because... Uh, racism or something. Um, Aunt, Aunt Jemima called and wants her likeness back or something like that. Anyway, here's four hours of Magnetosphere movie. And for all of you who are wondering about how it went in the bike race yesterday, perhaps I'll tell you at a later time. <laughs> uh, so here's the, here are the ground magnetic perturbations. And I promise we'll look at the GOES magnetometer also, momentarily. And incidentally, we haven't changed up the format today for any particular reason. It's just for fun. And uh, I would encourage you to go out and do things for fun, since it'll never be now again. <laughs> anyway, here are ground magnetic perturbations. And uh, we see a weak magnetosphere, so we don't see a whole lot of perturbations although we mainly see them over the, the real geomagnetic South Pole and the Canadian North Pole. We don't see any kind of perturbations over the Siberian North Pole, which is over here somewhere, over Siberia. It's like, it's as if there's a, there's a polar cold war going on in a cold area for the cold protons. <clears throat> and let's break out some more data. How about the radio flux? Let's take a look at the space weather enthusiasts dashboard. Sponges. No. There we go. The space weather enthusiast dashboard, folks. It's the best place to look at sunspot cycles. Or perhaps at the radio flux. Which is, well, really, I don't remember where it is, but it's something like 68. Looks like it's at 68 right now. Legit solar minimum values. And check it out. You can zoom in very closely on this. It's fantastic. There you go. There's the graph of the last year and a half or so. And uh, if you're wondering when I predicted solar minimum to happen, it was right here. Right here. It did go down lower. It was actually at 63. But these are the... Uh, the monthly values here. So it's not going to show you every little gyration in the radio flux. Next, we'll take a look at, uh, oh, I don't know, how about uh, the, the GOES magnetometer? I promised we would look at it, so there it is. And it's pretty spiky. We reach pretty high levels here. And let's look at the Gong 2 stuff. So here's the Gong 2 stuff. I highly recommend the GOES, I mean, not the GOES, the GONG. It's the gong2.nso.edu. What was it? The GONG. The Solar Data Viewer. Yeah, it's good times. Anyway, there's the latest on the top view ecliptic plane field plot. And as forecasted, we're still in the South Pole oriented current sheet here, shown in red. No surprises to me. Was it surprising to you? Next, we'll look at the line of sight field plot, see if we see any sort of changes or distortions going on with the B field associated with that sunspot, which would be over here, if there were any. And there really aren't. An indication that it's probably degrading. Although it's hard to see, and we can't see it from Stereo B, because Stereo B is busted. And how about the GOES electron flux? Let's move on to that next. And there are the current levels. They actually did get to somewhat significant levels here where the entire 
few hours was in a measurable range instead of totally cratered. And let's move on to the total electron content. TC, TCP, TC, what is that? Total, total elect, CTIPE. There you go, there's the total electron content forecast. After this, we'll show you what's going on in the ionosphere layer. A little bit higher levels of electron flux there throughout the air column. And keep in mind, new viewers, this is the entire air column, including thermosphere, ionosphere, and plasmosphere. Basically, the space in between you and your GPS satellite. And we see continued anomalies here over places like the Caribbean, Central Atlantic. You can see those there north of South America. Significant electron flux happening at nighttime. Next, the ionosphere map. And by the way, I've done this on purpose, folks. I, I could have put all the tabs up there like I normally do. This will help our viewers to be able to look at the data yourselves. And we see significant anomalies here. Um, yeah, check it out. Look at the daytime side there. Extreme charge discharge events happening right beneath the sun. So that's very, very anomalous. And next, let's look at cosmic rays. As it's been a little while since we've looked at cosmic rays, here's a Patatee and Barentsburg. Patatee's flat over the past 30 days. Barentsburg, also pretty flat. A tiny uptick there at Barentsburg. Next, Athens, Greece. Trivia question. Where are donuts made? Donuts are made in Greece. Anyway, there's the Athens neutron monitor. Looking flat over the past 30 there also. Next, Mexico City. Pretty flat there. Actually, a slight downtick over the past 30 days. And here's Olu and DOMC Antarctica. There's Olu, Finland. Flat over the past 30 days. And here's DOMC Antarctica. Not sending data here for a while. As it is now winter in, Ant in Antarctica, an interesting place to hang. And what's next? What should we look at next, folks? Send a request. How about earthquakes and volcanoes? Here's the past 24 hours of earthquakes. We see 52 on the map. And it looks like a downtick in earthquakes here. We saw a bunch of deep ones. Although here's a very shallow one in California. 20 kilometers east of Markleyville, right near the Nevada border, right near Topaz Lake, just west of Topaz Lake. That one was at a depth of negative, wait, 20 kilometers? No, that can't be right. Did you not see a negative depth? Was was I was I hallucinating? Oh, there we go. It's at 1,900 meters above sea level. And let's continue up the list here. It looks like a pretty much of a downtick here in earthquakes in the past 24. We saw a whole bunch of deep quakes. There's a there's a deep quake at Chile. It's only a 4.4 magnitude. It's at 129 kilometers depth. So a bit of a calming there of earthquakes. Deep quake at Fiji, 4.4 at over five, nearly 570 kilometers depth. And next we'll do volcanoes. Here's today's list on VolcanoDiscovery.com. According to VolcanoDiscovery.com, we see Mount Abiko. 
producing an 11,000 foot plume of ash. Sakurajima, flight level 6,000 there. Dakono, flight level 7,000 there. Popocatapetl, exploding, flight level 19,000 there. Fuego, this volcanic ash plume is not seen in satellite, which doesn't mean it's not erupting. Sange is exploding, producing a 21,000 foot ash plume. And Saban Kaya, exploding, flight level 25,000 there. Please do not attempt to fly your drone over the top of it, as you'll lose your drone. It'll become one with a bunch of hot liquid magma. All right, and let's talk about let's talk about climate. Let's first go to Global Cryosphere Watch to look at the snow. So what's here's the snow for the northern hemisphere. And while this excludes mountains, guess what? It snowed a lot in the mountains. That's over two standard deviations above normal snowfall, folks. This graph looks similar for the past two winters also. How hot is it? Oh my god, it's so hot it must be cold. Let's check out SciTech Daily and see what they have to say about it. Oh my god, clouds might be the likely in clouds. Oh my god, it's clouds. Are you angry at clouds? Are you worried that clouds are mirrors? Do you think carbon dioxide makes it cloudier? And are you deluded enough to think that cloudiest, cloudier days cause hotter days? It's so stupid. Oh. All right, so let me just break this down for you, folks. Clouds make the planet cooler in the daytime, and they make the planet warmer at nighttime because of the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is real as it relates to water vapor, unlike certain other chemical components of the atmosphere, which is why at nighttime, cloudy nights are warmer than clear nights. This is why it gets so cold in the desert, because it's usually clear in the desert. Clouds actually do radiate heat back to the planet. Now, in the daytime, I don't care what altitude they're at, of course at nighttime a cirrus cloud at 40,000 feet of altitude is not going to change how warm it is where you're located because that's not a thick enough cloud to hold in any sort of, any sort of uh, radiative energy to radiate back at the planet and make it warmer. Puffy, puffy cumulus clouds and stratocumulus close to the surface, low clouds in the lower troposphere, Make it warmer at nighttime. I can't stress this enough. It's a pretty simple concept, but apparently it's being added to computer models and uh, it's uh, mitigation by carbon dioxide. So anyway, in the daytime, even a cirrus cloud makes it cooler because they reflect some light back into space. Have you ever noticed that cloudy days are cooler and cloudy nights are warmer? Now, I don't know what the heck they are doing with these climate models, but I'll just scroll the article here and vanish. And I'll just scroll down so you can read it. We're hoping you don't lose an IQ point while reading it, if you feel like it. Um, and new research published in Science Advances gives an overview of 39 updated models that are part of a major stupid idiotic endeavor of people who don't understand atmospheric physics. How cosmic rays affect the climate. What carbon dioxide's role is in the atmosphere or much of anything else. And what they do is they tweak one variable, creating a garbage in garbage out computer model. And then they wonder 10 years later why the model didn't forecast reality. So, ECS. ECS. Well, what's that, you're wondering? I'm wondering, because I can't remember. I read the article earlier, and I made sure to not lose any IQ points. <laughs> Equilibrium climate sensitivity, folks. Equilibrium climate sensitivity. So what they're trying to do here is put a thing in the models that are not a thing. Now, the Earth's temperature is mitigated by the temperature of the oceans due to the latency of heat of this thing that we call water. And only about 1% of the Earth's heat latency lies in the atmosphere in the first place, which is why you can't measure the Earth's climate by measuring the atmosphere, period. You would have to know things like the temperature of the Indian Ocean at 3 meters 
or perhaps 300 meters. And basically the only real-time data that we have would be surface temperature, which is completely irrelevant information. So we're, we're, we're delighted to see people working on climate models, and we hope that people start to understand clouds a little bit better. Is this progress when it comes to meteorology and atmospheric physics? Probably not. And millions, if not billions, of dollars are being wasted on complete nonsense. Let's take a look at the NASA GOES interactive weather satellites. Actually, let's take a look at the ISWA site first, the Integrated Space Weather Analysis Center, because I'd like to know if there are Earth facing coronal mass ejections, wouldn't you? Well, here's how to find out. Just head here, click on page 7 of the, the sun portion, and then click on this, and then click on this, and then click on this, and then put in 100 frames, per, 100 frames before date and 20 frames per second, and then press play, and then you'll get this. And as long as all the data is actually there, you'll see that there are no coronal mass ejections facing the Earth. Actually, let's look at lightning maps. Aren't you interested in knowing where the lightning is happening? Well, I certainly am as it's a really quick way to see if there are any severe storms. And there is quite a lot of lightning, son of a beehive. Check it out. Son of a piece of... And it looks like there's some strike in the central U.S. Shout out once again to our Iowan viewers. Hey, Des Moines, I think you're in the crosshairs. Maybe get out before that arrives. Hey, Omaha. Go outside and look to your northeast. You may see an amazing light show if that thing's clearing up. And frankly, I have no idea if it is. Let's take a look at the radar. Here on Weather Underground, an organization apparently named after American terrorists. Cheers. <laughs> anyway, those are some severe storms there. Those are the kind of storms that would produce damaging wind and hail and possibly tornadic activity. Also, this area here over places like Kentucky, southern Indiana, and southern Illinois. Illinois! Next, we'll take a look at water vapor maps for the U.S. Actually, let's do Europe and Africa first. And there's the current state of water vapor, I think. It's loading. There we go. There's the water vapor for Europe and Africa. Looks like a significant low there over northern British Isles. I see a counterclockwise rotation. What say you? Next, we'll look at... Asia and Oceania. Give it a minute. We're streaming live. It'll load. In the meantime, let's check the chat. And if you haven't left a comment, well, why not? It makes me very angry when people don't leave comments. Just kidding, folks. I really don't care. Here's the water vapor maps of the Far East and Oceania. If you're wondering where things like planets and stars are located, too bad. Look it up yourself. Nextly. Nextly? Is that, a, is that a word? That's a word that I'm going to use bigly. Nextly. Let's check out the NASA GOES interactive weather satellites. Here's what's going on in the cloud layer. And see, what's happening now is you're getting behind-the-scenes stuff in a video that I've made public. Oh my god! By the way, you could do this stuff too if you understand the atmospheric physics to the slightest degree. Since we all have access to the same information, you'd expect there to be some consensus among reality, but apparently that's, uh, huh, that's some sort of a rare commodity these days. Speaking of rare commodities, don't forget to watch our video on socialism featuring special guest Eugene Bagashov, who, by the way, has extreme experience. Check out the streamers coming off of that system. There's actually two systems there at once. There's one overlapping the other one, so we've got a bunch of low clouds here. 
and we got this big upper level low pressure system. And it all depends on what the jet stream's doing. So let's have a look. Here's the water vapor map. And if you want to really get the skinny on your weather, if you're looking at the Doppler and you don't know what's going to happen next, the water vapor will enlighten you. So here's the scenario for water vapor over the US. And that system is looking like it's making a slight turn to the east as there's a little bit of dry air here that it's deflecting off of. And there's also a low pressure here that's being formed behind the jet stream pull. So the jet stream is creating a low here and it's going toward that low. It's going to switch to about a due east path shortly. Let's take a close up of that area as it's one heck of a storm. And again, if you're in the path of this one, you may want to put on your hard hat, get your kayaks ready, etc. It's looking pretty harsh. Let's zoom out a little bit so you can see timestamps. Look at all the streamers all over the sky, folks. Look at all those parallel lines. If you think those are chemtrails, let me just explain something. The resolution of this satellite is two kilometers. That means that one pixel, one pixel, Let me, let me zoom in a little closer so you understand what I'm saying here. One pixel is two kilometers, folks. If you think that aircraft are making these, I've got some squirrel poop that I'd like to compare its nuttiness to you because that is not a thing. Check out all the lines up here, too. Now, some of those actually can be contrail formed. Believe it or not, when the pressure is just right, a contrail can, can blow up into a giant cloud because it does create what we call cloud nucleus. But that doesn't mean that the chemicals were being sprayed intentionally. It's plain exhaust. Keep in mind, when a plane goes through the sky, folks, it creates a thing called a low pressure zone behind it. The same thing I create when I ride a bike. So in any case, what else do we have, folks? What else do we have? Did I miss anything? I don't really think I did. How about the KP index? It's currently at one. Well, that's not very interesting news, is it? I guess I could talk about some more things here. Um, let's talk about how scary it is that some places have reopened. Oh, no. Oh. So back to a story that I touched on uh, earlier. A Texas realtor has stopped using the word master bedroom in, in real estate advertisements. Now they're using primary bedroom instead of, instead of master. Uh, and then they expect all the other realtors to say, yes, a massa, yes, a massa, I won't use massa, massa. What a joke. Let's talk about Jersey Shore nightlife. Oh my God, did you know? that the Jersey Shore has reopened. Oh my God, you wanna be scared? Now that is scary. I mean, I'm spooked just thinking about it. It's just making me just inflate into a giant scared spook. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. The flames are growing behind me, <laughs> growing ever larger. Oh. Well, it turns out that they've opened some bars. And I, I'm so scared that that I... Oh, wait, 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 hold on, wait. What? It's... It, it seems like the fire has lost some of its intensity. Check out this article from Lehigh Valley Live. LehighValleyLive.com And the author of this brilliant piece of writing, who, by the way, is illiterate in the English language, is called... Jeremy Schneider, yes, Jer J. Schneider at ngadvancemedia.com. Feel free to send him an email about this brilliant, brilliant article that he wrote. It's about how Jersey Shore nightlife is back, and it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> is it because he saw Snooky at the bar? I I'm not sure. Let's see. As soon as I pulled up to the bar, I was ready to call it a night. The scene... Bar anticipation in Lake Como. 
better known as Jersey Shore Nightlight Juggernaut Bar A, which I don't know what goes on in New Jersey, but I don't go there. I stay the hell on this side of the Delaware River because that state, if you're from Jersey, look, I don't have beef with you, but what's going on with your government? And and uh, it just, uh, what? No thanks. Like Philadelphia, I have boycotted an entire state. The long, cramped, and mostly unmasked line to get into the outdoor bar almost sent me packing before I even got to the thermometer-toting bouncers. Oh, my God! Had these people learned nothing of the uproar over the the Yaz debacle down the street in Belmar last weekend? I certainly didn't learn anything from it, because it sounds like complete nonsense to me. I wrote two months ago that many shore bar owners feared that coronavirus would be worse than Sandy, and they're referring to Hurricane Sandy, not the dog being walked by the woman in the ski mask featured by Paul Joseph Watson. Shout out to Paul Joseph Watson! Ugh... <laughs> uh. But they meant lost profits, not spikes in COVID-19 cases, all in the name of pounding $5 cans of Coors Light. Right? Seriously, you got to read this article. It's freaking amazing. A few police officers were bunched up not too far from the line. They didn't seem phased or even paying attention. They weren't wearing masks either. The, the line moved slow, partially because every patron entering the bar had their temperature taken with an infrared thermometer, as opposed to an ultraviolet thermometer, the kind that isn't a thing. A necessary precaution that I would argue any bar should implement while the disease that has killed nearly 15,000 New Jerseyans is still out there, even if the curve has been somewhat flattened. But, and by the way, this author who is illiterate has already used an adverb, in pl I mean an adjective in place of an adverb, and started a sentence with the word but, which is supposed to be a conjunction. Well done, N NJ Live, whatever, whatever, LehighValleyLive.com for printing this nonsense. He starts out a sentence with a conjunction. But even if you don't have a fever, you could have coronavirus, in which case you shouldn't be quarantined or forced to wear a mask, because quarantining people that aren't sick or making them wear a mask is complete nonsense. And by the way, most people don't present any symptoms. So I guess I'll just stop talking about COVID. Do I have any more articles to rant about? Oh, here's one. Trader Joe's mask requirement. Oh, my God. A woman shopping without a mask at California Trader Joe's caused a scene Friday, calling employees Democratic pigs and screaming effing GD profanities. I swear I have more. There's one about the American Lung Foundation. What, what is it? The, uh, the Americans for Breathing have stated, hold on, I'll get to it. Just bear with me a quick moment. <laughs> anyway, I'm out of here. It's time to, uh, it's time to look at some more images of the sun here and close out this video and call it a day and go do productive things. How about a 94 Angstrom's video? It's a 48 hour SDO video in 94 Angstrom's of the sun. It's about that time. Time for me to sh -na 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 -na. vanish. And if you're riding a bike, get used to what the back of my jersey looks like. It's the only likely part you'll see. So anyway, remember, when staring at the sun, don't drink. And if you do drink, don't drive. Or just don't drive, period. Because I don't want to see you out on the road. And since it'll never be now again, may those COVIDiots be absent from your neighborhood or universe, or multiverse, or whatever you consider to be reality, and that solar wind at your back.